What's up, everybody? Stacking Surfer here. Welcome to the stream today. Um, I've got a great guest for us. I know many of you guys um, have been following Andy Shackman from Miles Franklin. And um, today we've got an opportunity to ask him questions. So what I'm going to be looking for is for you guys to have some great questions today. Um, I know I've got a list of I've got a list of questions right here for Andy that I want to ask um, for myself. And I know many of you have been thinking about this over the last week or two. Um, so we're looking forward to your guys' questions, and we're going to go ahead and just jump in and get started. Um, so I'll bring Andy up here in just a second. But before we do that, um, go ahead and hit that thumbs up. That's going to help uh, wake up the algorithm for YouTube so that more and more people will know that we're doing this stream right now. Um, and then also go and invite at least one other friend to come and check out the stream. It, it'll be really good. It's going to be a great show today. So um, without further ado, I'm going to bring Andy up here. Um, and uh, Andy, welcome. Thank you. How are Thanks you? Good to you, man. Good to be back. It's good to have you. Um, you know, happy Monday. Monday mornings can always be a little bit rough. Um, I'm still in the morning time. For you, it's the afternoon, so hopefully the day is going doesn't well. Matter. Matter. Oh, you know what? I got to get this over here. It doesn't matter. There Mondays you know. suck. Mondays better. suck most of the time. It's a drag. Sunday night, you know, the real is it. I don't know. I'm always more tired Sunday night than I am Friday and Saturday night just knowing I got to get up Monday and start again you know but it's all right it's uh it's better than the alternative i guess definitely so we've got a lot of people that have been watching our videos that we've done in the past and a lot of the, the interviews that you have done on other channels and um, people started asking me they said hey um stagging surfer we need to have andy on we need to ask him some questions sometimes there's a little it. bit of a delay and all of that so um, I've got a quick question that I'm going to ask as people start putting questions in the chat. So for those of you that have a specific question for Andy, please go ahead and start putting those in the chat um, and we'll we'll start getting through to those. So the first question I have for you, Andy, is we have seen some major price action in gold and silver over the last, let's just say, week or so. Um, really, it all kind of started hitting maybe two or three weeks ago. And then we saw kind of a crescendo of, to me, what looked like a, a new breakout. Um, happening on Thursday and then really kicking until Friday. Um, and then all of a sudden we see a flush down and we see it within pennies of hitting $30 on silver. So a quick question that I have for you is, are we starting to see a breakout or are we starting to just see some, you know, some other kind of movement that's going on? What, what, what do you think is going on today with silver and gold prices? Well, it sure seems like a breakout. It's exhibited unbelievable strength and resiliency in the face of so many things that people would say uh, would be negative for the price of gold. Certainly no uh, U.S. retail uh, demand, hardly at all, in the respect of where it should be. ETFs bleeding out now. You know, I was talking to my buddy Bill Holter. I said that to him today about the ETFs bleeding out. And he said the same thing that I believe, that the bleeding out is actually those people who have the ability to bleed it out, taking physical possession of that metal. And, and what looks like share redemptions is actually metal redemption. It's an interesting thought. But, I mean, you have people that have been selling into the rally is the moral of the story, along with, uh, you know, positive real yields. Now, I said that to Bill, too. He said, yeah, bullshit. There are no positive real yields. The numbers are fake. And I believe that, too. I mean, the inflation numbers are fake. But the point of the matter is, is that in my mind, the central banks that are accumulating it, they don't care about these signals or about these correlations between rates or a strong dollar or the divergence between gold and, and rates. I think if you look at a comment that was made by the chairman of the Shanghai Gold Reserve in 2014. Now, again, you know, you always hear they think in terms of years or decades, we think in terms of minutes. The guy says that the Shanghai Gold Exchange will change the current gold market with its consumed in the East, but priced in the West arrangement. When China has the right to speak in the international gold market, the true, true price of gold will be revealed. And this was in 2014, and when you see the amount of gold, 17 straight months that the Chinese have bought, according to the Bank of Montreal analysts, well, well, well um, understating how much they really own. Alistair McLeod would tell you they own 38,000 metric tons, 20 by the state, 18 by the people. But really what I see happening, and I would say, look, you know, 
there really isn't a real top for assets like gold in, in dollar terms because, you know, just like uh, who wants to be the last one holding worthless paper, I think is the way that the central banks are looking at it. Of course, you know, Voltaire's statement, all currencies revert to their true value of zero, I think in this case is very is very um, true. And look, the bottom line is, is that, you know, the central banks, they don't care about any of these correlations. They're just trying to, I think, de-dollarize and accumulate metals. And they're the ones, in my opinion, that are pushing this up. And I don't think you've really begun to see anything yet because there's an old statement that says there's no bull market like a gold, a gold bull market because it, it speaks to a different mentality. It, it doesn't speak to wanting to make profit. It, it speaks to protecting your ass. And and this is why you see at 3 p.m. last Thursday a $1.6 billion sale of gold futures in about three minutes, which temporarily knocked down the price. But, you know, you do something like that, you're either a complete and total moron or you're doing a drive-by shooting. Because when you sell that large of a position, the idea is to bleed it out over time, not dump it onto a very thinly traded market at the end of the day, uh, when really it's it's in a transition between you know um, um, New York and, and Asia, and it, it's just complete stupidity. But anyways, bottom line is, yeah, it does seem like this is, is different. It, it seems like the central banks, in my mind, are choosing gold over treasuries, which have the, the risk of, of not only uh, default, but in the case of our brain-dead treasury secretary, who in Brazil said, you know, a member of BRICS, we need to confiscate, not just sanction the Russian Forex reserves. And now she's at it again. And uh, in an interview with CNBC from the, you know, it's too stupid to be stupid category, she says the United States is prepared to sanction Chinese banks and companies, as well as Beijing's leadership if they aid Russian military in its invasion of Ukraine. Well, it's okay for us to That's aid impressive. the Ukraine, but it's not okay for China, their ally, to, to aid. So now we're making demands. And, you know, she goes as far as to say, you know, um, that... Uh, we stand ready to act if we see significant violations and it's it's uh, anything that involves Russia's military aid is is unacceptable. And, you know, the whole thing is nuts. She says uh, China is entitled to have a relationship with Russia, but, you know, anything of military aid, well, we're going to sanction you. Now, this is the whole driving force behind, I think, the strength in commodities, strength in gold is that these countries look at gold, which has outperformed for 25 years, a treasury bond by a huge margin. It's out, outperformed the S&P, and it's done so without counterparty risk, without sanction risk, without default risk. And I think this is what is putting a floor under the price of gold, which I expect to continue to rise. I, I think that sounds, first off, weaponizing the dollar, I think, was the biggest mistake that our our current administration has done as far as financial stuff, in addition to a lot of other things. But that started a basically a, a war there. So any first question I've got coming out of the audience here, I'm going to flash it on the screen here. Hopefully you can see that. Um, when do you think the COMEX will be exposed? I, I mean, look, I think you could argue to a degree it, it has been um, exposed. I mean, I mean, it has. Right, let me read another thing to you here, because it's important to understand who's exposing, you know, I talk all the time about people that are well read, just they read the wrong shit. And that's the bottom line. They just read the wrong stuff and they don't pay attention. But the people that matter, right, they get it already. And this was I mentioned on, on several interviews last week uh, that there was an article in the news agency TASS and the Kremlin aide Yuri Yashakov, and he's talking about the BRICS currencies. Uh, the new currency that's coming. And he reiterated a lot of the stuff that we've already said about it being a basket, uh, two baskets, one of national currencies and one of commodities, largely gold. He said it would be digital. And this is the Project M-Bridge, which is the cross-border payment system that allows these countries to trade uh, that, you know, uh, and, and supersede the, uh, the the SWIFT system. All of these things we've known, we've been talking about it for a long time, but here's the interesting part of that 
article that people need to understand. And, and, and it goes exactly to this question. Who knows it? Well, the people that matter know it. And he says the second part is price. He says for the moment, for the moment, price is determined by Western speculation. We produce these commodities, we consume them, but we do not have our own price mechanism, which will balance supply and demand. During the COVID panic, the price of oil fell to nearly zero. Now we know it went to negative 40. So he's a little off there, but he says it's impossible to make any strategic planning for economic development if you do not control prices of the basic commodities. Here's the interesting point right here. Price formation with this new currency should get rid of Western exchanges of commodities. So they understand. In fact, they just developed the BRICS grain exchange, and he talks about global prices are primarily determined by the Chicago Commodity Exchange. Moscow also seeks to move away from trading grain for U.S. dollars in favor of national currencies. They understand that the prices of commodities are controlled by the COMEX. And for a long time, I would argue, they have been using it against us. This is how they have slowly, slowly and methodically drained the exchanges. This is how they have taken possession of so much. But more importantly, this is how they have accumulated so much of what they they see as vital and important, the only other tier one asset in the world, gold, at, at subsidized prices. It's, it's using your opponent's aggression or leverage against them. And that's exactly what they're doing until bang, all at once, the Shanghai exchange or the, the Moscow exchange or the exchange in Dubai takes over the price. And you can already see that slowly happening by the arbitrage that we're seeing in Shanghai with silver price as much as three bucks an ounce higher. So they are enticing those traders who have the ability to uh, take delivery or buy the, the make-believe price on COMEX and in the West in London and deliver in Shanghai at a premium. And this is, I think, the beginning of, of the ultimate exposure of the COMEX. And, and look, it won't happen. It won't happen um, probably the way that we all think it will play out. But at some point, people are going to say, I'm not going to deliver at any price, let alone this make-believe price in the West. And that's when the real price starts to set in in the rest of the world in, in place like Shanghai Gold Exchange, which is largely cash and carry. So there's always a price. But what is that price? So yeah, I think it's already being exposed and, and by the people that actually matter. That makes sense. So that, that kind of takes me into this next question that comes from Miguel. Um, he's asking, do you know, could we see, he's asking, do you see, but I think the other question is, is it possible to see $100, uh, you know, per ounce silver in the next two years? And I, I would add to that question, would that just be because inflation's gone up? Or would it be because there's some additional price discovery and real value being seen in silver? Well, I mean, look, when you speak in terms of could or would or should, yeah, it should, it could, and it probably will. Um, and I say that to you, not out of hope, right? So right now we have gold at, let's just call it 2350. If we divide by 42, the average price of the last, uh, 200 years between gold or the relationship between gold and silver has been roughly 42 to one. Uh, it's at roughly 85 to one way out of whack at 42 to one that puts it at 56 bucks. But yeah. if you take the real current mining ratio of seven to one, what it's truly coming out of the ground at and take 2350 divided by seven, well, you're at $335 and 70 cents. So when you talk about Logic. And Andy, that, that's all without inflation happening. Right. And the inflation adjusted numbers, if you take it and go way back, you're talking silver that could actually go into the multiples of that. Now, I don't want to say that's going to happen. But look, the one thing I have learned in 34 years in, in finance is that bull markets will go higher than anyone ever thinks possible, i.e. the Dow Jones. When I started, it was 2100 or 2300. And, the, and, and, and markets on the other side will fall further than anyone thinks possible and take forever to come back, evidenced by the Nikkei at the same time was nearly 40,000. And, you know, they owned the world from a, from a financial standpoint at that point, including, you know, all sorts of landmarks like Pebble Beach and Rockefeller Center here in the States and anything with an engine or a motherboard, they made better. And their Nikkei collapsed and just recently over the last month or two came back to where they where it was when it collapsed after 34 years. It took that long just to get back to even. And that's when you burn a generation so badly, it'll take a whole new generation 
to get back to regain the trust. So yeah, I I think that $100 silver, as crazy as it sounds, is no more crazy than someone saying the Dow Jones would go you know, to over 35,000 when I started in this industry in 89 or 1990 when it was 2100. So yeah, I do. And logically and geologically, it should happen. Yeah, absolutely. And it, the reason I, I phrased it a little bit differently than just hitting 100 is for the point you just made. You know, a lot of stackers are out there looking at things and they say, hey, if silver were to get to $100 or $300, we're buying a, you know, a Coca-Cola for, you know, 50 to 100 bucks. And that's not necessarily the case, everybody. So Andy just outlined that very articulately here. So another question for you, Andy, here, um, and I think this is an important one um, for those stackers, including myself, that may be continually accumulating. Um, you kind of alluded to it. We may get to a price where people don't know what to sell it at. Yeah. Um, how, how does that happen for you guys as a company? So for Miles Franklin, for example, what happens if you see a, ma a major price uptick? What does that process kind of look like? And, you know, do we have to be patient through that? Um, do we, you know, is it something we try to hurry and call you guys and grab as much as we can if we see something jumping? Um, you know, not financial advice as far as being um, going crazy and, and just FOMOing into anything. But um, when you're looking at business and trying to keep a flow of, of goods and being able to provide your customers for what they're asking for. Is there a backup plan? Is there, how do you deal with some, something like that when that happens? Well, like I said earlier, there is no bull market like a gold bull market because traditional bull markets in, in, in securities, as an example, you know, focus on people's greed. They, they say we're motivated by two things, greed and fear. Okay. And and the greed side of things, you're taught when you double or triple your money, you know, sell some back, reinvest, go somewhere else, play with the house's money. In this case, the higher the price goes only reinforces the mentality of the people who already have been stacking it after, you know, suffering for so long with counterintuitive behavior and knowing you were right, but your eyes lying to you when your gut and your brain are saying, hold on um the, the public won't sell and when you realize that you have one half of one percent allocation across the entire um financial matrix from joe and jane six pack to the harvard endowment fund you see one bank get bailed in you see one really horrible thing and i'm not wishing for any of this in any area i don't care what it is that wakes up the public uh, if you saw a 5% allocation, which is what most financial advisors will, will say, which is way under allocated, we'll say, let's just say it's 5%. That's a tenfold increase. And what happens in this industry is, is kind of like what happened to our company in April, March and April, where we added 14,000 clients in 45 days. That's years worth of client acquisition because people freaked out when the banks failed and yet they weren't even bailed out as Dodd-Frank says they're supposed to be. So what I'm simply saying to you is that, look, there's six major mints in the world. Uh, there are others like Mexico, which hardly delivers anything, or China, which hardly de delivers anything. But in my mind, you have the United States and Canada. They're the only two in North America. And then you have South Africa, Australia, Austria, and the UK. And at some point, these countries, if things really got nuts, would would I think you know favor uh, nationalism over over you know sending things across the the pond to the United States to our demand. Uh, and if the U.S. and Canada run out of product, which they've been more or less for the last couple of years, at least the U.S. Mint has been the model of inefficiency. What is flush right now, which was will go down uh, in my mind as one of the most largest contrarian indicators I've ever seen, where the central banks who know the playbook are, are literally finding every way to pull everything off the shelves that isn't nailed down. The public, which has been selling into this market, uh, maybe because they need to, or maybe because they can't believe gold is that high, um, will we'll miss out. So, you know, it's one of these deals where, and I say it to you sincerely, this industry is just like every other industry. It's just in time. You sell what you sell, and when you sell out, then you have to order more. And oftentimes we order, you know, um, preemptively. But 
even then in a really crazy market, that stuff gets sold before it's delivered. And how much can you really keep on hand? We already have millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of metal that's hedged, but you know, a billion dollars would clean out the retail market. And now you're, you're make, you know, making new purchases from mints and refineries around the world. It, it sounds like a lot, but you know, the big companies, myself and JM Bullion and SD Bullion and Atmex and I don't know how much more than $100 million any of these companies have, and probably a lot less than that. So, you know, you're not talking on hand what is very, very flush right now like that can become, um, you know, more of what we saw in 2020, 2021, two, and part of three, where supply and keeping it in stock was the biggest the biggest challenge we faced. And, and this is without the public really getting it and at the same time you got bank of america saying three thousand gold and thirty dollars silver within the next 12 months you got ubs saying it could go to four thousand within the next two years and goldman uh, up their forecast to 2700 so you know i don't know what that means when the bullion banks are saying it but what i am saying is that this is a trend that has not caught the public's attention but a lot of the world sees it and um how that ends i don't know so um, that's why you cost average, you buy when you can, you be methodical, just like working out or dieting or anything that you want to be regimented with. It's the only way to smooth out the uncertainty that's in front of us. No, I, I think it's a good point. Um, you know, I, I've seen it over the past here too. It's, it's starting to fill this way again, where people that are looking for monster boxes end up having to wait three months to get them. Um, well, the so, U.S. Mint just is really poor with issuing silver time. eagles. And, and I will say that there are two interviews that I've seen that I think everyone who owns metals need to watch, period. Uh, and one of them is the uh, the first one was the interview by with my buddy Chris Marcus and Bart Chilton, where he admits so much of the things that we talk about. Uh, he is the former uh, CFTC chairman. He died about a week after that interview with Chris. He says things about J.P. Morgan and Bear Stearns and uh and jamie diamond mm -hmm. and and um bernanke and and all of, i mean stuff that you can't even believe he was saying he was saying uh and the other is the one big Weir did last year with um the i think his name is jack sermon the guy that that has for since the beginning of 1986 has been running the silver eagle program and in essence he admits it's a three-part interview people need to listen to it I, I mean i was listening to it on my raft in my in, in my swimming pool last summer I almost fell in the water when I heard it. I'm like, did he really just say that? Where he said, you know, I, I was told by my uh, superiors, which, I mean, who is his superiors? Is it the person running the mint or is it Janet Yellen, the treasury secretary? It is underneath the treasury. And where he was said, uh, was told to print or issue just about as many silver eagles as he could or as few as he could without creating a massive public outrage and, and uproar. And, uh, you know, they're they're mitigating the amount of silver that they're issuing. And, and the why is the hard part. Why the hell are they doing that? Not sure. But yeah, uh, the mint has been the model of inefficiency. So when these two mints run out of product, uh, it's game over because the public ain't going to sell if the price is taken off and the world is crazy as hell. It will be like, see, see you all. I told you. And, and they're not going to sell, go back into fiat. And that's why there is no bull market like a gold bull market, because as it goes higher, the scarcity becomes more and more as the secondary market literally dries up as people become more and more concerned and the motivation they use to buy it to begin with only becomes accentuated and especially if you've been of you know in this market long enough you understand how aggravating it is to see something clearly and be wrong as it pertains to the outcome at least right now uh, ultimately i think we won't be but I think that's something that uh, is in the cards is, is the market will be defined ultimately by a very difficult ability in, in sourcing product for everybody, not just companies, but more so the public. Yeah, I think you're right on that. Um, and what's interesting is this the same conversation I'm hearing about Bitcoin right now. So you've got the ETFs are buying up. Um, a lot of people that own Bitcoin are not putting it back on the on the market. At least this was the conversation last week. Um, and so they kept talking last week pretty heavily about uh, what happens when there's no supply. And it could really run the price up. Now, as soon as the Iranian retaliation came in over the weekend, um, that definitely flushed down Bitcoin. I think it went down 10%. It's back up a little bit from that. 
So there's other conditions with Bitcoin that can be affected by either the stock market or, or by geopolitical things that are going on too. But the reason I bring that up is it, ha it has less to do with Bitcoin. It has more to do with the mentality of, of what's happening there. Um, a lot of people that do purchase Bitcoin do not necessarily consider gold as a safe haven anymore. Um, they look at it as a, you know a shiny rock. Um, but the rea reality is there's a lot of the same dynamics because they've already been there for a very long time. And so, you know, my friends that have Bitcoin, I do admonish them to hedge their bet with Bitcoin, with gold and with silver to back that up should something happen um, in a direction that they're not prepared for. Um, and I think the points you just made are very well taken there that can definitely happen with gold and silver. It's happened in the past. So one other quick question for you, Andy. By the way, the you know, I think and, and I say this with respect, I think it's naive as hell to look at that things that way. Every central bank in the, on the planet does not own um, Bitcoin, but they own gold. And and yep. why people believe things need to be mutually exclusive of one another is beyond me. It's a naive, shallow-minded viewpoint. You can have both of these things. Yeah, I mean, we should all be complementary to one another. We come into the room for the same reason. It is the understanding of what's happening to this country and to our currency and to the fiat system, politically, geopolitically, even socially, morally, and ethically. All of those things all come into play. It's that typically the Bitcoin person is more enamored and, and consumed with making a massive profit. And, and the person who buys gold is more concerned about preservation. So why not marry the two together? You make some profit, put it into something that is, is safe and stable. And, and the most well-informed traders on the planet, not just the wealthiest, the most well-informed, and that's the central banks, they're loading up on it like it's going out of style, using the suppression of the Western market. And by the way, one of the ways that they suppress it is through the ETFs. There's a massive short position on SLV, a naked short. It's a huge amount. Let me just see, read this number to you real quick. Last Friday, someone naked shorted 12,599,986 shares of SLV to knock the price down. And they'll try and do the same thing with, with Bitcoin ETFs, but all manipulations and badly. The point of it is, is that to hedge your, to not, to look at the world so narrowly through one prism is a mistake. And you learn more and more about less and less till you know everything about nothing, have an open mind. And I think you'll be a whole hell of a lot better in the end. And it doesn't have to be either or we're on the same side on the opposite side of fiat and tyranny and, and author authoritarianism and all of these things that, that you can find liberation in holding your assets yourself without counterparty risk. There's no reason to be either or. I agree. So um, I'm a proponent of having diversity within your portfolio. I'm also a proponent of having diversity within your um, precious metals portfolio too. So I like to have some things that are vaulted. I like to have some things that are close to home. Um, I'll play with mining stocks from time to time. I'll also, um, you know, do a few other things that are around that kind of in that area that we talk about on the channel. But in addition to that, I'm also a big fan of real estate. I do have cryptos. I do have Bitcoin, um, but they all serve different purposes, and I put different allocations in them based on my um, risk, risk tolerance. So Andy, thank you for that clarification. Yeah. So one other question here that is coming up on a lot of people's minds um, is this election that's coming up here. Um, you know, what, what can, how can having a different president or a different political party in the white house affect the price of gold and silver? And do you see that, um, you know, do you see that being a big factor or is that less of a factor these days? Well, I mean, to me, it's a huge factor. Uh, look at what's happened to the country. You know, 12 million people in here illegally, uh, lawlessness in the cities. I mean, I'd say this all the time. To me, this is a bigger issue. And, and none of it's lost upon our, um, uh, our foes or our allies who wonder what the hell's happening to this country, questioning and, you know, questioning the, the electoral process, questioning the judicial system, um, uh, looking at, at cities <clears throat> that have become completely lawless, where cops get beat up in broad daylight, carjackings going on in broad daylight, where you have homeless people, uh, courtesy of, uh, of 12 million people in illegally, and who's paying for their, their shelter, their education, uh, uh, their, 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 their food. I mean, all of this stuff and, and all of the things that have made this country great, you know, moving away from, uh, God and moving away from the nuclear family and, and moving into a system where, you know, there's cancel culture and it's woke and all of this stuff. Yeah. I think if, if 
I, I honestly, I believe, and I, I know this isn't a political channel, but God help us if the current administration stays in here. And at that point, there's nothing stopping it because with all of these new people who they're trying to give voting rights to get into the, the country, look, either way, you're going to have half the country pissed off. But when you look at what's happening to this country right now, where you're getting a trillion dollars every quarter in uh, in debt accumulation and 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 a country that's addicted to spending. I mean, we're borrowing money. We're insolvent. And we're broken. We're giving more and more money to Ukraine. And now we we are actually talking about confiscating the the Russian forex reserves and using it to give to the Ukraine. I mean, it's like people saying, can we borrow money from you? Even though you're broken and solvent, can you borrow from someone else and then borrow it to us? It just makes no sense. And I mean, we, this 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 country needs a change. And uh, I, I know a lot of people are polarized around Trump, but I think he has a far greater chance of um, slowing down this controlled demolition and maybe even reversing it than this current administration who is hell-bent on doing everything possible to lose the world reserve status, not only weaponizing the dollar, signing executive orders to go green, destroying our our um, our, our natural, um, our own gas production, and not only that, the strategic petroleum reserve, and um, and going more and more and more into debt while this country is getting more and more sideways in every single way. So, yeah, I do think that if this current administration stays in, uh, it, it's going to be awful, personally, for the economy, and um, who knows how high gold and silver goes. That doesn't mean that Trump will come in and fix everything. You can argue mathematically we're so far down the rabbit hole it will be very difficult to stop and it's that's why a lot of what i i think the stupidity that we see is intended you know i mean if if you realize what makes the dollar the dollar is the protection of the saudi kingdom that's the petrodollar signing an executive order to go green and then sanctioning and confiscating assets of Russia sanctioning Iran, sanctioning all of these countries, saying you can do this, but if you, if, you know, you can't do that, even though we can fund the Ukraine. If you, China, give money to to Russia, well, then we're going to sanction you. Too. We go around in that manner. We are incentivizing this all to happen. And and if this country still had the morals that it always did when when we were young, and and you respected authority you didn't you can still question it but you respect authority we know that the elections are real there's a process to getting into the country you know there is no lawlessness in the big cities where you feel scared to walk from your hotel to a restaurant in san francisco at 10 o'clock at night all of this stuff that continues to happen it's too stupid to be stupid and so yeah if we have that's, a leadership that doesn't <laughs> fix this stuff now it, we're gonna we're gonna go down the toilet bowl as far as i'm concerned gold and silver go to the moon but who cares at that point i i agree with you um i don't think anybody's this stupid to do this stuff or at least not a cabinet full of people right um there's too many people that understand we're taking the watch off now she's talking all right um there's too there's too many p smart people in the room for this to be stupidity. I think it's very well planned, and I think there is reasons why they're doing this. So to your point, um, I do think this election is going to be the most important election in the last hundred years we've had, and I so think it's going to make a determination on whether this country goes into a lot more chaos like it is now, or it starts to to get itself out of this hole. But to your point. Um, you know, voting for for Trump does not mean everything is going to get fixed and that, that everything is going to get fixed overnight. It may take a while for us to do it. And sometimes it takes us all waking up to the fact of what kind of predicament we're in to to make changes. Um, you know, I, I've been guilty of not being very active in my in my local politics because I'm a dad. I've got kids I've, and I've got a job and I've been busy in my own stuff. And the reality is, is a lot of us probably would benefit or our communities would benefit from a lot more local action. So that's something that I'm hoping to do as I get a little bit older to put some more time into that. Um, but Andy, I appreciate that. Um, here's a great question from Daniel Wood. Um, I'm not as familiar of what's coming up this week, but um, I don't know if you know what's happening with these reports or not. And if you see them giving any kind of an effect up or down towards silver. Uh, you know, Big Square sure does. I think he believes that the um, Silver Institute will have to to up uh, up their their numbers on solar panels. Look, I mean, there's a group in Canada that is lobbying uh, 
uh, aggressively to have silver change from a um, industrial metal to a strategic metal. And I, I talk a lot about the fact that I, I met a gentleman in San Francisco, I mean, excuse me, in um, uh, Vancouver uh, recently, who had been at two of my speeches over the last two years at the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference, a really good show, by the way, I pe recommend people check it out, Jay Martin. Uh, and he told me, look, you know, this is all declassified. I work for the Department of Defense. I'm a contractor. I've been involved in the Patriot missile program. And you're right. There is almost 500 ounces in the tip of a Tomahawk cruise missile. Well, look at all the missiles that are being fired all over the place. And and the, and the Silver Institute doesn't have any breakout for military uses. You, you got to wonder why. And, um, you know, the, as an example, when you talk about catalysts for silver, there, there was a, a French, um, let me just read this to you, it's kind of interesting. Okay. Uh, the, there's a French frigate, and um, it's called the, the, I can't even pronounce it, Al, Alice, Alice, whatever, forget it. It's the name of, a, a, of a, a military ship, a French military ship in the Red Sea, and they, they had to turn around and go back home because they ran out of missiles and munitions. And the missiles that they're shooting are two million bucks a piece. And they're they're firing my at you know five thousand dollar ten thousand dollar drones and they're going bankrupt. But how much silver is inside of this stuff? So the point of it is, it doesn't matter what the silver industrial or the silver institute comes out and says. And that's the the, the problem with the whole market is that everyone's so reactionary. See the big picture, and you'll know that you know this is how the the big money positions ahead of the the masses. They they get in when no one's looking. Look at India. They purchased 400 million ounces of silver in the last two years. And then just this year in February, March, let's see, January, February, we see that, let me give you the numbers. I did write it down. Um, that they increased by, uh, where the hell is it? One second. Uh, geez, I can't find it. Hang on. You know I have it here somewhere. So while Andy's looking oh, here at it, it is. They, their imports surged by 260% in February. They bought yeah. 2,932 tons in the first month of the year compared to 3,625 tons for the entire year, and no one's talking about it. There are countries that understand what's going on with the price of silver. And whether it be a $3 premium in Shanghai or India, literally buying up everything they can at these make-believe prices in the West, one of these days, it, it's going to take off. And maybe it's it's a Silver Institute report, but I don't look at that as being significant enough. It's going to be a catalyst where it just there's some form of a force majeure, let's say, on, on COMEX or, or massive deliveries that don't get filled or whatever it may be, something, an event will wake people up. It certainly, in my mind, won't be a report by the Silver Institute where only us people realize it. The fundamentals that support these markets should have been spoken about and screamed about by the mainstream, as well as the suppression of the market for the past several years. They should be screaming about it. They, we should all know that J.P. Morgan paid a $920 million fine for suppressing the metals market. Why does nobody know that? And on and on and on and on. But, you know, you have to come to an alternative media station like yours or listen to a goofball like me to hear these things. Uh, the public is asleep. And, the, and, and in reality, the Silver Institute's numbers, yeah, they might wake some people up, but not to the level that will be meaningful, in my opinion, at least not immediately so. No, I think that I think that helps, Andy. And, it, you know, I, I've got a lot of friends that are Indian. I work in high tech. And um, guess what they do when they have extra money? Mm -hmm. They don't put it in the bank. They yeah. buy they buy they buy grams of gold and they buy silver. Yeah. And that's what they do. That is their money that because they see the real intrinsic value of the metal. They see what it's that it is the money. It's not an IOU or a, based on debt. Now, here's something that could catalyze the price of silver to rise. And, you know, Mexico's president is on the way out. Uh, this guy wants to ban open pit mining, and he's actually trying to change the Constitution for an all-out ban on open pit mining. And his presumed successor, this woman who's leading in the polls, 
um, would be the first female president in Mexico, and she evidently supports the, the same change that completely ban. And I mean, you're talking Mexico and Peru are the two, the epicenter of silver mining, and they want to ban it. So you know, could that? That's the type of thing. Far more so than what the Silver Institute tells us. Um, in my opinion, uh, no disrespect to them, but I think something like this. Again, and how many people know this? Why isn't that all over the news? Because it's just, it's, 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 they don't do a, a bad job of telling us the important stuff. They do no job of telling us. And that to me is something that could be more of a catalyst to see silver go parabolic when the world realizes that one of the main sources of, of silver for the last, I don't know how many decades is now going offline and no open pit mining whatsoever becomes part of their constitution. That that's huge, guys. If you're not realizing what what Andy's just saying there, um, you you pinch off the supply. Prices are only have one direction to go, and um, it also takes time to start new mines. You have to find supply too, and you've got to dig, and the costs go up, and everything else. So it, that alone, right there, could drive a, a huge up. Right. So so Andy, um, just is kind of a middle thing. We still have a lot of we still have a plenty of time here guys to fill the questions i just wanted to throw out there if you haven't asked your questions yet please put them in the chat um i would be curious if you guys are buying put a one in the chat if you're buying silver right now put a two in if you're selling it um i saw a comment in here that um the broke stacker just mentioned that his lcs just received five monster boxes from a customer so i know some people are in the point where finances have gotten tight they're starting to sell some of their metals back so it you know, hopefully they bought them a lot lower and the metals have done the right thing for them, which is, you know, sure if they're purchasing power. But at the same time, people are turning around and buying those boxes right back. Um, I know I'm accumulating um, metals at the moment. I'm not div divesting myself of them. Um, but Andy, as we accumulate, as we start to see situations where, um, you know, the prices go up, I live in California. We get taxed to the hilt on everything. Um Darren brought this point up here where he's talking about in Arkansas, and I know there's a handful of other states that are making gold and silver considered legal, not, not exactly legal tender, but you can use them to pay off debts. You can use them to, um, to pay your taxes. Um, I have a lot of family in the state of Utah. The state of Utah has not figured out exactly how to take the metals in, <laughs> gold and silver, to be able to do that, even though it's on the books. And so they're trying to figure out how they're going to do that. <clears throat> do you have any thoughts on you know, as metals continue to increase and get bigger, are there state, does it make more sense to be in certain states when you do go to exercise or sell some of those? And I'm not asking tax advice for it from you or accounting advice on that, but are there, are there differences in states? Yeah. I mean, there's huge differences in states. Um, I mean, on many levels, I left Minnesota, a state that I loved very much Mary Tyler Moore, Little House on the Prairie, because they lost their mind a few years ago. And while I left my corporate entity there, I moved to, to Florida, um, which seems to have a much better grip on reality. But in, in terms of uh, that specific question, I do believe that's, you know, one of the big driving forces for Silver Eagles <clears throat> is that you have Many states that have passed these laws or have them in front of their constitution, or excuse me, in front of their legislature right now, rather, uh, where silver eagles um, are arguably worth the higher premium. Um, I think that, you know, certainly most of the, um, <coughs> excuse me, most of the legislation on state to state basis reads any sovereign mint issued coin, which would be Canadian Maple Leaf or Austrian Philharmonic or UK Britannia, whatever. A couple of them, and Arkansas might be one of them. I um, I think Texas might be one of them. Specifically, mention U.S. Uh, minted coins. So, if I had my druthers, yeah, I'd buy all silver eagles. My mentor Richard Russell always said, in the end, it's about the number of ounces that matter. And to agree, he's right. But to another degree, having you know the right form will mitigate a lot of aggravation and you know so you could argue that silver eagles might be worth the premium but you can buy silver maple leaves for two three dollars an ounce cheaper is it worth it maybe only time will tell but uh, certainly the legal tender issued coins would would be the way to go 
um, regardless of which ones you get, if you are looking at what these states is saying and embrace it. And it's huge. I mean, it, it's kind of the American spirit creeping up that there is a little bit of pushback to the madness of the uh, monetary policy of the Federal Reserve and the brain dead fiscal policy of the U.S. Um, uh, it, yes, if I had my choice, I'd buy and, and own Silver Eagles above just about everything else. So we've had, uh, you know, I've had other guests on the channel before. They've talked about owning. Um, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mess up the word here. It's, it's owning the coin of your country. I'm, I'm not saying the right technical term, but um, yeah, they're all sovereign. But I, uh, it's coin of the kingdom or something along those lines. Coin anyway, of the realm. Coin of the realm. There you go. And um, you know, at the end of the day, as far as price goes. If you're paying within two or three dollars of different product, um, I don't think it's going to make a huge difference in the long run. I would buy what you like. Uh, me personally, I've been buying up Eagles the last few months. Um, other people I know feel it's a little too expensive. But for me, I'm looking at the price that it was last year. It's way less. And I've really only been stacking silver now for four years. Um, I wasn't able to get Eagles at five or ten, ten dollars. And so um, I see the writing on the wall that the price is only going to be going up now. Will we have some some downs and ups? Yes, we will. So there'll be some times that are a little bit better to buy than others. But at the end of the day, when we start to see those $100 prices, $200, $300 prices, it's probably not going to make a huge difference whether I paid 2 or $3 more for an Eagle if that was my preference. At least that's well, my I, I think people should often think about liquidity at the beginning of the transaction rather than sure. realize what you have at the end. And... Um, you know, with if you grew up when when I did uh, in Minnesota, you know, like you'd go to the hardware store every Friday, they'd give away free popcorn to the kids and they knew everyone's name. And the guy jumped over the counter. How you doing? How are your parents? What's going on? Have some popcorn. What do you need today? I mean, that was different. And now we have the big box uh, store mentality where instead of focusing on quality and relationships and thinking about things um, in a certain way, now we try and maximize every penny spent and, and we buy, you know, we, we buy in bulk at Costco or Sam's club, or, you know, always trying to get the, the biggest bang for the buck. And there's, there's legitimacy in that, but it also can come to the detriment of liquidity. And I think that, you know, it's always important to think about that in the end, in the most dire of circumstances, whatever you own, you should have great liquidity with. So, yeah, I mean, the silver and the gold eagle would be my number one choice across the board in buying metals. I just I think that you have instant demand, instant liquidity uh, everywhere around uh, North America that that um, will never be, you know, haggled with, whereas a uh, a buffalo round that that's made by a private refiner or whatnot. Well, maybe maybe there's some question: Is it real, et cetera? You know, whatever. I don't need to go too far down that that path. Sure. But I just think you're best off by buying things that people want, and and even if it costs a little bit more, that's not money that a company like mine is making. We make the same no matter what you buy. That's just what the market. Look, we were buying them back for the most of the last three years at, at over eleven dollars over spot. So it goes both ways, not just when you buy, also when you sell. I, I agree. So kind of my philosophy has been um, if I'm within two or three, maybe even four dollars of, of rounds versus sovereign coins, um, I'm typically leaning towards the sovereign coins. Once once that premium starts to spread out, I, I usually go with rounds. So um, I like to stack multiple different kinds. I've also got constitutional silver. I feel like that's going to be a little easier to to potentially barter with if we get into an SHTF situation. Um, but, you know, I have different kinds of metals for different purposes. So, yeah. um, you know, I like to have a, a quite a bit of variety of that. Um, all right. So we had another one here that I thought, let's see. Yeah, this is the right one here. Um, do you see a day where we're going to be using the metals as, um, as money again? Um, I don't know, kind of God help us if we do. I mean, unless it's alongside in states like we're talking about, I could see, I do believe gold will back a new system. I do believe there'll be a marriage of blockchain and gold in, in just like the BRICs have been telling us for the last three years. Um, 
why would the, the most influential bank in the world reclassify gold as the world's only other tier one asset? Why are the central banks buying it hand over fist and, and haven't stopped since 2017? Why are they all repatriating it from exchanges and from the Bank of England and the New York Fed? Why won't the New York Fed tell us how much gold they have sent out of uh, their holdings to other countries? The whole thing is really weird. I think it is that um, gold is being remonetized across the globe. I think the weaponizing of the dollar has pissed off so much of the Southern Hemisphere, if not most of the world. And it, more than anything, it's created a situation where we are not trusted the way we once were. And so gold is replacing the bond. And ultimately, that would mean gold will go higher than people think possible. And there is a 90 percent correlation in all of history between gold and silver as well, by the way. So, um, you know, I think sky's the limit for where this this market ultimately um, is is heading. Certainly, but um, you know, I don't know how this all plays out. I, I really don't. I just think that it's 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 happening. If you if you pay close attention, you can you can see it happening. And and I want people to think when you think of the central banks, it's not just that they have more money. They know they know the playbook. They all started repatriating their gold and accumulating it in 2017 and 18 massive amounts. Where in 2018, a group of central banks who had just repatriated all their gold from the New York Fed bought more gold as a group together uh, than they did in the 60 years previously combined. In 2019, that number doubles. And then, oh, out of the, out of the clear blue, the BIS reclassifies gold as tier one. So, you know, gold will be money. Um, it just it's a question of, I think that's where the blockchain comes in, is that it allows it to not be convertible. In other words, uh, Gresham's Law, or or even De Gaulle from France, who who came and requested all the gold, which made Nixon close the gold window, proves convertible currencies convert. And if you can show the immutability and the veracity of what's peg of what's backing it, pegging it to a system, having it audited, et cetera, you have a shot at at, at gaining trust, where people say, "Fine, the, the Fed or this institution does not have the latitude to print, 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 print." And the way to find a middle ground for that is to peg 10 or 20 percent of every new currency unit to gold at a fixed price and and so they still have monetor, monetary latitude to create more money or to do things but not so much to go off the rails where a country like ours can just print you know it, where in the last four years this, this country's printed more money than in the history of the country preceding it and 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 now we're paying the price for that with inflation that is nowhere near uh, fully done expressing itself so yeah I, I think it's it it will be money, but I don't know if we'll be spending it at, at the store like they did in you know the 1800s. Sure. So do you can you can you foresee a situation where if a country is trying to shore up its currency with gold, that um, instead of just minting a lot of coins that everybody's using everywhere, um, are you alluding to there could be countries that start using the blockchain or a cryptocurrency that's backed by gold? Yeah, hundred percent. I think that's the only. Way. I mean, look, Kristalina Georgieva, the head of the IMF, said, uh, you know, a, a central bank digital currency that's not pegged to something will be fiat. Why would the BIS, the most influential bank on the planet, reclassify gold as the only other tier one asset? Why do they keep buying at the central banks? These are questions that you need to ask yourself, and then say, why the hell does no one know that gold is the only other tier one? why do we never hear any of this so so yeah i think there's no reason after 75 years of it just being treasuries and dollars as tier one for them to quietly oh by the way let's make gold tier one and and so when you see the actions um more so than the the verbiage it to me speaks volumes and um i think gold thing history doesn't always repeat but it rhymes and and the, and the point here is that gold i don't think will be you know, held in our pockets the way it was prior to 1933. But in order to gain trust in a system that has blown all of it, I mean, you talk about pissing in the punch bowl. Here, here's a new bowl of punch. Have some. It's good. You know, no. I mean, it's got to be something completely different. Like, um, you know, and I think that's what they realize. And that's how you marry the the blockchain technology, which is gaining legitimacy, and and gold, which has been money since the beginning of time. And Again, I will say it again, the central banks know the playbook. If you look at all the banks that are tied to the BIS, they were told to accumulate gold. 
They were told to repatriate it two and a half years before the BIS reclassified it as tier one. They know the playbook. They know the timeline. And if you look at the amount of, of European Central Bank gold purchasing in, in relation to their GDP, it, it's uncanny how they're all almost at the same amount. It's being remonetized across the world. It just hasn't happened yet in dollars. It will. And uh, But what it represents is, is something that, again, is an asset that is not simultaneously someone else's liability. And, and, and in a world where treasuries can be sanctioned and confiscated and used to fund a, a war against, against the enemy, uh, that doesn't fly. And the rest of the world says we're out and, and we need to break free from that. Not too fast, cut off mm -hmm. our nose to spite our face, but fast enough to get the hell out. And, yep. uh, and that's what they're doing right now. So it is money. It will be money. It's always been money. And as JP Morgan said, gold is money. Everything else, I think that's what he said. Gold is money and everything else is just credit. Something just like that anyway. And yeah, and yes, cool. yeah. So, so Andy, last question I have for you um, personally is, um, you know, we're looking at this conflict with Iran that just came mm -hmm. into play. Um, and, you know, we saw, we saw Bitcoin go down. We saw the gold pegged um, cryptocurrencies go up skyrocketed up to like 3000. I forget which one it is. Um, Paxos, I think. Yeah. Paxos. Um, so that one went skyrocketing up. So, you know, do you, do you see kind of a, an opportunity here to take advantage of, of buying right now? Um, do you think we're, we're going to see more of a retrace coming or do you think uh, we're, we're in that breakout and we're going to see some stops along the way? And this is one of those stops. Well, first of all, gold didn't go down really. I mean, it did. It went down. But remember, at Friday at 6 o'clock Eastern, the market is closed globally, really. I mean, it, it's open 24-7 except from Friday at 6 to Sunday at 6, more or less. And Paxos has the ability to trade freely independent of when the spot is trading. And, you know, it did open up uh, 30 bucks higher. Um, and so it is going higher, but it's also important to note that, you know, like we said earlier, the number uh, was, what was the number that the idiot sold? I mean, there's a massive, massive drive-by shooting in the pr price of metals, uh, you know, to, to, to drive it down, where nobody, the person who did that, who sold, um, you know, the crazy amounts of gold and silver in in three minutes to or gold rather to drive down the price they'd be shot and fired and maybe you know probably in that order um because that's not what you do to maximize the the price it, you know one well, point like six billion of gold futures in three minutes and so yeah. it didn't go down but it's it's interesting uh it went up i, I think that um you know, because gold and silver have been suppressed for so long, who really knows how high, damn high, the price is going to go? And um, I, I think the only way to smooth out uncertainty is, I, like I say, when I started this company, it was 34 years ago. I was 20 years old, barely. And I, I tell it all the time. My father said, there's only one rule. You'll buy something every two weeks or don't work here. Yep. And I've owned the company outright for two plus decades. He won't fire me anymore. Like he said he would, but I, it was the best gift he's ever given me ever. He taught me how to pay myself first. And so every two weeks I buy something when I get paid, I don't care if it's only one ounce of silver, pay yourself first. And that is the only way to smooth out this uncertainty. I mean, yeah, I could say it's a great time to buy. It is at all time highs that we do see positive real return in 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 rates that are you know the whole metric is is bs coming from the bureau of labor statistics it's we know it's much higher inflation it's 10 or 11 percent according to to john williams of shadow stats where you know it's 50 bucks to bring to bring three or four people to mcdonald's right now the, the inflation is way higher so we're lied to consistently and continually and one of these days the whole thing breaks so do I think it's going to go higher? Yeah. Do I realize it's at all time highs? Now I know we're talking your know, silver channel primarily, and I shouldn't just focus on gold. When I say gold, I mean silver too, but I do. I mean, I think silver could go higher than anyone thinks possible. I really do. Look at what India is doing. This is a country oh, yeah. who knows the playbook. So yeah, um, you buy, but you buy, you know, incrementally and do it as often as you can and you'll smooth out uncertainty and, 
and uh, look at it as wealth, not as an investment. I agree. So last thing I'll say is I, I went to McDonald's yesterday with my son, or I guess it was Saturday with my son, and um, he wanted just some ice cream. $4.80 for an ice cream cone at McDonald's. Yeah, I'm there like, was a great article by the Kobe and I'll read exactly what it said. He says, price inflation at every fast food restaurant in the U.S. has far exceeded CPI inflation since 2014. Prices at McDonald's have doubled since 2014, while official inflation data shows just 31% inflation. Prices at Popeye's, Taco Bell, and Chipotle have risen by 86, 81, and 75% respectively. Now feeding a family for one meal at a fast food restaurant costs more than $50. Fast food is officially expensive, but if you were to ask most Americans, they would say the economy is bad right now. If you look at the ec economic data, it would say the economy is strong. Why such a big dis disconnect here? Shout out to the Kobayashi Lair. It's great. It's true. It's true. Yeah. And, and so we're being lied to. So all of the stuff that you're gauging, metrics and all of this stuff, uh, it's all a bunch of BS. And I think you should use every opportunity to put money away. Pay yourself first as an opportunity yeah. to get out. And let compounding work for you instead of against you be regimented and and um and i think that's the best answer i can give you but yeah i look if someone gave me 50 million dollars and said do something with it uh i don't know where i would put it other than really maybe a farm precious metals or short-term treasuries of of 90 days or less and that's about it i don't know where else i would go and, and have any peace of mind that's for damn sure i think it's a great idea so andy one of the things I'm going to put a shout out for with you is I've got I, I I've got friends that have been using you for a while that that tout the white glove service. We've had many people mention it here as well. Um, and if you know, one of the things we talked about earlier is you added um, was it 13 or 14,000 customers in a very short period of time. So I'm going to just throw it out there. Um, if you guys are considering Miles Franklin and using them, or you're looking for another source of bullion or even other coins. Um, I would recommend signing up and getting an account set up with Andy now before there's a big rush for it. I think it's just going to be easier for you guys to do that. But how do they go about setting that up, Andy? Well, we have a website that that took forever to build, and I, I'm not really happy with it. Our new, new website's coming out in June. It's done, basically. Yep. We're just tweaking it. Um, but in the meantime, the best way to find out our real prices, which uh, we keep close to the vest, which will be as good or better than 98% of the companies in America would be info at milesfranklin.com. Say the stacking surfer sent me and um, you can request the price list, which is not published and way cheaper than what we show online. Uh, you can ask any questions about what you heard on this show or on things corollary like precious metals IRAs or whatever. Uh, all of our brokers are highly uh, educated. Most of them have distinguished careers before working with us on Wall Street or graduates from Wharton or all those kinds of things. And um, and they're all my friends, friends that came on because of our friendship, not because we became friends when we worked together. A lot of these guys I go back to elementary school with. So we're a tight knit, close, uh, as you mentioned, white glove company, kind of a uh, a hybrid model. If you just want the price list, ask for it. Just make sure we know it came from you. Uh, it's important to us. And, uh, and you know, there's no obligation in requesting any of this. No one will call and hassle you, but we'd love to work with you. So uh, yeah, info at milesfranklin.com would be the best way to go for now. Awesome. And then when you guys do mention Stacking Surfer, there is a small affiliate that helps this channel, helps me be able to get the information out to you guys um, more readily. So Take a look at them um, and do call because they do have different pricing. You'll, you're going to see much better price when you do that. Well, Andy, I want to thank you so much for coming on today. This was great to do a live chat. You got it, um, my man. My pleasure. Awesome. I look forward to doing it again. Let's not wait so long and let's do it. Yes, let's do it. All right. Thank you. Yep, Thanks, everybody. Care.